Thank you all for joining us tonight. It's uh, a pleasure to be asked by the Pride Council to participate in this year's virtual Pride celebration. Uh, it's too bad that we can't all be together celebrating, but it's uh, amazing to get to share some information and some work from the Rockwell Museum's collection as part of Pride this year. And I think it's especially um, poignant to celebrate this week with the Supreme Court's ruling on Title VII and its applications to the rights of the queer community. So it feels like a very special week to celebrate. And um, I hope you enjoy the program. I am going to preface it by saying that uh, in preparing for tonight's um, happy hour, I went down about 600 rabbit holes uh, looking at different artists and, and different um, ideas about uh, queer art as it relates to the Rockwell Collection and as it connects to the bigger idea and the bigger question of what makes an artwork queer. Um, so unfortunately, what we've ended up with tonight is not a particularly didactic presentation, but um, what I've subtitled as a queer art salad. So it's going to be a mix of experiences and information, and I hope that you find something that's of interest to you um, and perhaps inspires you to do a little research and thinking on your own. And as Amy mentioned, we're going to do a little uh, conversing and investigate together the idea of uh, what makes a work of art queer. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I'm really happy to share this version of the updated pride flag that Jess Beatty from the Rockwell team put together. Uh, it was inspired by one that the Ashmolean Museum did. Um, and if you're not familiar, this is a new design that's inclusive that includes people of color and trans people as part of the pride flag. And Jess used works of art from our collection to uh, create this uh, photo montage of the new pride flag. So I think it's, uh, I'm really pleased with it and uh, I was really happy with what she did. And it's made from a very inclusive group of artists from the museum. So as I said, this, this is a little bit of an experiment and a little bit of a, um, a different presentation. So we're actually going to begin our investigation of what is queer art uh, with a poem. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Frank O'Hara, but he's one of my favorite poets. And um, <clears throat> he was uh, active in the mid 20th century and a part of the New York School of Poetry. He was involved and connected to many of the visual artists of that time period, like Grace Hardigan, like Ra Larry Rivers. And this is a photograph depicting um, Larry Rivers and Frank O'Hara working on a lithograph. They did a lot of collaborations together and they were actually lovers. Um, Larry Rivers' primary relationships were with women, but he was bisexual and he and uh, Frank O'Hara had a relationship. And this is one of my favorite poems by O'Hara and we tested it earlier and this is actually a recording of O'Hara reading the poem at a poetry reading in Buffalo. So uh, turn up your audio just a little bit and we're gonna hope that this does what it's supposed to do. The next poem is called Poem Two. <laughs> Lana Turner has collapsed. I was trotting along and suddenly it started raining and snowing and you said it was hailing, but hailing hits you on the head hard so it was really snowing and raining and I was in such a hurry to meet you but the traffic was acting exactly like the sky and suddenly I see a headline, Lana Turner has collapsed. There is no snow in Hollywood. There is no rain in California. I have been to lots of parties and acted perfectly disgraceful, but I never actually collapsed. Oh, Lana Turner, we love you. Get up. Um, one of the reasons that I like this poem is that I find it very um, peculiar because to me, it expresses a very uh, gay sensibility even though the imagery, the language, the subject of it isn't necessarily um, gay. But um, in Frank O'Hara's uh, encapsulation of this moment and this headline and this connection that he makes with this Hollywood star, Lana Turner, who's collapsed and his own behavior at parties um, has some sort of uh, a sensibility to it. There's a campiness to it. Um, which is a part of, of gay and queer culture, um, but there's also just something to it. So this is one of the things that got me thinking as I was preparing for this, this talk, what exactly makes the work of art queer? 
does a work of art, whether it's a poem or a painting or a sculpture, have to literally have subject matter? Does a work of art have to be made by a queer person to express a gay or lesbian sensibility? And I ask these questions not as someone who has the answers, but as uh, someone who is at a point of inquiry and, and, and wants to look at some works of art and think about those things. So what we're gonna do now, we have Janelle, our queen of Zoom working behind the scenes, and she's gonna put us into two different um, Zoom rooms where we're gonna have some conversation led by Amy Ruza and Taryn Nye around some of these questions. We're gonna spend about 10 minutes. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just gonna be a conversation about what you think might or might not be inherent to thinking about um, queer artwork. Uh, and then when we come back, we're gonna take some of those thoughts. Um, Taryn and Amy are gonna share some of the highlights with the full group. And then we're gonna apply some of those ideas to some work from the Rockwell Collection. Um, so Janelle, are you ready to uh, move us into the rooms? Um, I've got to go to both rooms for just a couple of minutes, but um, Amy, was there anything, any thoughts or ideas that uh, jumped out from the conversation that you all had? Yes, we had a very talkative group, lots of great ideas. Um, we talked about perspective, uh, looking at the world through different lenses. We thought we talked about um, conveying a, a message and how youth or students, I know Maria was talking about a project that one of her students did and had hidden meaning within the artwork, um, finding a way to share their identity uh, with, their, uh, with their family and thinking about different symbols that are included in art. And then we talked about <laughs> non-queer artists and uh, non-queer actors playing the role of, of someone who's queer or a novelist. And then someone talked about um, art being subjective and how you don't necessarily have control of how you look at or think about um, an artwork. It may not be what was intended um, of the artist or maker. Those were some of the main points. Taryn, were there some points that came out of your conversation? Um, we had some similar conversations um, about perspective and whether um, the way the artist identifies themselves is the most important aspect of identifying whether the art is queer or not. Um, but I brought up a point about empowerment and maybe whether, regardless of how the artist identifies, if that is maybe one of the like cruxes of the conversation. Um, and then Leslie brought up what I thought was one of the most resonating points is that empowerment is subjective all in itself and what one person finds empowering is not necessarily what another does um so that was one of the most resonating points i think from our breakout section but no answers overall the <laughs> questions are still to be to, yeah still lots to be of answered. questions mm -hmm. more questions <laughs> yeah thank you all for uh leading those conversations and thanks to everyone for their thoughts and for participating I'm gonna share a couple of uh, works from the Rockwell's collection um, and kind of test some of these ideas and conversation we had. And um, if you have questions, then please put them in the chat and, and we'll try to, to get to those as well as part of the, the conversation. Um, we have in the Rockwell collection, a suite of prints by Andy Warhol. It's actually the last uh, series that he did right before he died. It's called the Cowboys and Indian Suite. And this is John Wayne and Annie Oakley that are from that set. It's a mix of imagery that is both real and fictional cowboys, um, Native American uh, people, as well as symbols and um, other uh, imagery related to both. So I think, you know, when we think about Andy Warhol, um, and within the art world and within the art community, it's very well known that he was gay. He had a, a partner for most of his life. Um, but a lot of the artwork that he put out into the world was not necessarily um, overtly queer in subject matter. When we look and think about um, some of the paintings he did that were of Hollywood celebrities and the sort of uh, uh, icons of that time period and, and turning them into even, even more iconic images like Marilyn Monroe and Elizabeth Taylor, uh, there's something there to me that often gets overlooked because the perspective is very different. There's not, um, in his uh, idol idolatry of um, Marilyn Monroe or Elizabeth Taylor, he is not 
um, depicting those women because he's attracted to them, because he finds um, himself sexually attracted to them. He is depicting them because he's, he empathizes with them and he empathizes with their position uh, within our society as women who went through a lot of trials and tribulation, um, who, were, uh, who struggled against the roles that they had uh, within the film studio, who struggled in their relationship with men. Uh, so that's something that I feel like Warhol put into these images and that's one of the reasons he chose to depict them. Um, here with John Wayne and Annie Oakley, again, it's like these are not queer subject matter. Um, you know, John Wayne's not even a real cowboy, FYI. Um, uh, and Annie Oakley, I think, you know, she's a really a Western feminist icon, um, but was very straight and, um, and not, uh, not a queer icon necessarily. But the way that Warhol's depicted them has this very, I don't know, expressive use of color, this ornamentation, um, this decorative quality, especially looking at the medals that Annie Oakley is wearing and how he's treated those, that to me just brings sort of a, a queer exuberance to them. Um, so there, to, in my opinion, again, this is just my, my opinion on this topic. It doesn't mean it's the right one, but uh, he definitely brings that sensibility to these works. Um, two other works in the collection, the riffing on the same idea of Marilyn and Liz, um, this is writer Shimamura's uh, works from 2014. And uh, Shimamura is not a queer artist. He's a third generation Japanese uh, American uh, who is often dealing with issues of race in, a, in a, an amusing way, um, looking at popular culture and how people who are not um, from the white um, popular culture imagery and find themselves and uh, interact with it. In this case, we have two um, geishas, uh, kind of stereotypical Japanese um, depictions, and they're both looking in the mirror. And instead of seeing themselves reflected back, they see Andy Warhol's Marilyn Monroe and Andy Warhol's Liz Taylor looking back. So on the surface, it's this commentary on, um, on culture and the absence of representation, the absence of being reflected in the larger media um, that many people who are in, uh, in, in non-white minority groups uh, find themselves. Um, but I also had to wonder when I looked at this, if he's not also kind of doubling down, if he's not kind of riffing on uh, Warhol's depiction of these people uh, and, and, not, um, and not seeing himself reflected in, in, in culture. And if Sherwood War is kind of playing on that and appropriating a little bit in a positive way, using it for his own ends to again emphasize um, this, this uh, lack of representation in our culture. I meant to bring up Marilyn a little earlier. <laughs> I forgot she was hiding there, but this is Andy Warhol's Marilyn from 1967. And this is the source material that um, Schumann Moore was using and referencing in his print, Marilyn. Um, in Andy Warhol's uh, depiction, again, he is taking this image of uh, a Hollywood star and really just turning it into something completely different, taking a photograph and turning it into a work of art that celebrates someone in a very, um, different way than what was originally intended by the photograph, which was a stock image issued by the studio of Marilyn Monroe as a character from a film. Grant Wood uh, is an artist you're probably familiar with. He did the painting American Gothic, which is an iconic image um, in our uh, society. It's, it's reproduced widely and lots of people have done different uh, takes on it and uh, parodies of it. I'm sure they're just a million. Um, but Grant Wood <clears throat> was uh, a closeted um, gay person, and even after his life, his family uh, attempted to keep him closeted. So well, he died very young in, in the late 1940s, and his sister uh, had control of his estate, his papers, his letters, and she kept an iron grip on those and ensured that the narrative around Grant Wood was maintained as she thought it should be and didn't reference um, the knowledge a lot of people had that he had a gay identity, even if it was a very much uh, on, very quiet. With Wood, um, it's really interesting because he's part of the regionalists, and this is a group of um, artists who were depicting the Midwest. Everything that was wholesome about America in the early and mid 20th century, farms, um, farm life, small town life, agrarian, 
um, Arcadia, this idea that everything is perfect out here in the heartland of America. But uh, you have to wonder when you look at, at Wood's uh, works, um, sometimes I think about uh, the perspective and um, the way that he's looking at the world is a little different. When he was younger, Wood uh, traveled in Europe and he was very influenced by Northern Renaissance painting. And if you're familiar with Northern Renaissance, a lot of those paintings have a perspective from above. You're like you're standing on a hill as you are in this print, looking down upon a landscape or a village or a scene. Um, and that's where Wood took a lot of his inspiration. But at the same time, uh, when I look at his works, it almost feels like someone from the outside looking in. It uh, doesn't feel to me like Wood is depicting his culture and, and his world, but rather more like an anthropologist. He's someone who is really uh, investigating what this, um, what this means, what living in this society and this time period and this geography uh, means to these people, but not necessarily to him. Um, of course, it's like there's, there are some other images uh, by Wood that have uh, other uh, ideas that might, you know, this is a, a horse-drawn uh, wagon and a landscape, so there's not necessarily a subject matter here, but there are some of his paintings that do have more allusion to his identity as a gay man, and there's a lot, we won't get into the Freudian nature of these fence posts or anything like that. Joke, joke. Um, <clears throat> Stephen and Alan Ladd um, are brothers. Uh, Stephen is gay, William is straight, and they work collaboratively. This is a work that was commissioned uh, by the museum for our 40th anniversary in 2016, and it was a part of the exhibition that they put together pulling from the museum's collection. And when I was thinking about this, again, it's, a, it's kind of a problem because if you say that a queer artist makes queer art and a straight artist makes straight art, what do a queer artist and a straight artist make together? Is it like half queer? Is it half straight? I don't know. Um, but I was thinking about some of the traditions of, um, especially coming out of feminist and lesbian art in the 70s and 80s, um, and also thinking about Grand Fury and the artists working as part of ACT UP and the, and the uh, protests against um, how people with AIDS were being treated and the, the AIDS pandemic. A lot of it was collaborative. There's this uh, quality within the queer community of collaboration that extends beyond just the, how artworks might be made, but with, with other work that the, is done within the community. So part of that resonated with me, as well as um, the use of craft, which uh, is often um, more uh, manifested by women artists rather than men artists. So to have these two men who work in this very craft-based technique that might be seen as very feminine, that might be seen as um, not necessarily, you know, big, bold, abstract uh, paintings that requires physicality or large sculpture that requires strength to, to move and manipulate. Um, again, it's sort of contrary to uh, expectation or, or narrative. And these are two prints by Mark Toby, and these actually have not been exhibited at the museum. They were work we acquired in 2017. They're from a suite of seven prints that Toby did in 71 called Transitions. And you may not be familiar with Toby, but he's part of the ABEX group from the mid 20th century, but he was part of the, um, the group working on the West Coast, the Seattle School of Abstract Expressionism. And Toby struggled to find um, his place within that group because in the East Coast, the New York School, uh, th they're very straightforward. They don't really, um, the, the idea around a lot of the ab X that, uh, that was being produced in New York and the New York School is that it's devoid of subject matter, completely devoid of inspiration. It is gestural, it is expressive, uh, it is not about something, it is not trying to depict something. And Toby doesn't necessarily have that perspective um, he uh, grew up and spent most of his life in Seattle. Um, he was a practitioner of the Baha'i faith, and he also had a profound interest in Eastern mysticism, um, which he applied to his work. So he didn't necessarily see what he was doing as being devoid of, of inspiration or devoid of subject, even though it was non objective. He felt it was part of his spiritual practice and a part of his expression. So, again, 
Um, Mark Toby was a queer artist. He and his partner, they ended up living in Sweden during the last part of his life. Um, and, uh, but again, this, the subject matter here is not uh, of depicting anything that we would say is necessarily queer or gay. So again, that question of well, how does his identity um, align or how is it reflected? Um, but again, the question is, um, does it matter? Does ha having that knowledge of who he was matter? I would argue that it does because having the knowledge that his Baha'i faith was very important to him, that his interest in Eastern mysticism was very important to him and applied to his work of art. Um, if those things are essential, or if those things help us understand what he was trying to do, then also understanding what his identity was as a gay man, also as a part of that equation. When I was in graduate school, I was in a seminar on uh, women artists, and I actually did a presentation on lesbian art. And my professor told me that the identity of the artists I presented, even though a lot of the imagery was overtly um, lesbian in nature, uh, was not important. Uh, and I thought that was really interesting because we were in a seminar about women artists. So if, uh, if identity or perspective isn't important, then why are we having this class in the first place? Uh, so I, I struggled with that for a very long time. Um, and I feel that um, for me anyway, uh, in a lot of cases, understanding who someone is, regardless of it is their religious perspective, um, their identity, their ethnicity certainly helps us understand uh, where they're coming from and maybe not everything that they're trying to tell us in their work of, in the work of art they've created, but at least part of it. Um, so uh, when I was pulling together who I would talk about, um, I think it's pretty obvious to you that um, there's people who are not represented here. I just showed you, um, as far as the queer artists I showed, they're all um, white guys. And so um, there's a lot of people who aren't represented in the Rockwell collection. Um, I didn't talk about uh, Martine Gutierrez, who is um, <clears throat> a, a queer woman that's represented our collection. This work of uh, Shoshi Peely was added uh, to the collection last year, and it's from the series of projects she did called Indigenous Woman, which is a glossy magazine exploring gender and sexuality and identity through the notion of like Vogue or a fashion uh, magazine. Um, and I didn't talk about her because I'm actually gonna talk about this work next week as part of our music and Margarita's happy hour. So if you wanna hear more about Martine Gutierrez, then I hope you'll join us next week. But um, she's really the only uh, openly queer artists of color that we have in the collection. So I was like, who is not here? Who is not represented? So I wanted to, to acknowledge that because that's something that, um, you know, we're working on as an organization is uh, trying to bring a more diverse representation of our society and hopefully engender conversation around those differences that help us understand one another more clearly and also understand ourselves. Uh, so this was another one of those rabbit holes that I went through. Um, this uh, is a work by Cassells called Pissed from 2017, and it was a performance and installation piece. Uh, Cassells works in a variety of media, a lot of it um, <clears throat> riffing on some of the work done by feminist artists like Eleanor Anton and even um, the minimalist artists like Donald Judd in the 70s and 80s. And this was a work that was done in protest of the bathroom bans that happened in, in 16 and 17, uh, which uh, Cassells collected their urine and then exhibited in this gallery. So uh, she collect, they collected their urine for um, 30 days and uh, protests to inaccessibility to, uh, to restrooms. Perhaps less controversial on the left is Romaine Brooks. This is uh, her self-portrait from 1923. And Brooks is, is infinitely interesting and um, I suggest that you go to the Smithsonian American Art Museum website. There's a small online exhibition about her work and, and they have um, the majority of the paintings that she created. Brooks was from a very wealthy family, but her mother was uh, just sadistic is how she's described and her brother as well. And she spent her childhood and, and young adult life in these large homes all over the world, kind of avoiding her family. Um, Eventually, her mother and her brother both passed away, and she became the recipient of this uh, vast wealth 
So she moved to Paris. She became a part of the Demimond. Um, she explored her identity as a lesbian, as she is in this uh, portrait where um, she's really exploring the idea of gender and fashion. And there's all of these great paintings she did of these people who, in Paris um, who are really just trying to find out who they are and show that um, through the fashion that they choose, through the identity that they choose. Uh, so super interesting uh, woman. And I would love to have a painting by uh, Romaine Brooks in our collection because she did numerous self-portraits and she's just really uh, super cool. Um, Deborah Bright is an artist who's still active. This is from her Dream Girl series from the late 80s in which she inserts herself and her butch identity within the narrative of Hollywood. So she's really just kind of interrupting what's happening between Holly Golightly uh, in Breakfast at Tiffany's and jumping in to light that cigarette before this guy can get to her. And she did a whole series around there. Again, uh, bringing representation to a space where it wasn't, inserting her identity um, and, <clears throat> and sexuality in a place that it wasn't. Catherine Opie is one of the most important photographers of the uh, second half of the 20th century and now. This is a work she did from the 90s called Self-Portrait and Cutting. And she really was instrumental in bringing a lot of Im imagery of the lesbian community to museums and galleries. And she's done a lot of work um, since then in a variety of different um, uh, material and media. Um, Harmony Hammond, uh, again, abstract work, not objective, coming out of the craft tradition of the 70s. Uh, but bringing it to a larger scale, turning it into monumental, taking up space in a gallery with fabric and fiber and, and sewing and weaving in a way that it wasn't before. Devin Shimoya is an artist that's working now and I love his paintings. He did this whole series. This is from a series he did on, on haircuts called Not Too Close. Um, and it illustrates the African-American community. Um, he does a lot of imagery of, of the drag community and it's this mixed media, just exuberant um, textures and glitter. And it's just so fun uh, that I just, I would love for us to have one of his paintings, our collection as well. Lex Barbario uh, has an ongoing project called Ambisextrous and it is exploring the, gender identity of people who really hadn't thought about exploring it. So it's not necessarily depicting transgender people, but having people step out of their comfort zone about their own assumptions on what their gender depiction looks like and, and uh, explore some other ideas about themselves. Jeffrey Gibson is um, Creek and Cherokee uh, queer artist, and this is from his series he did of punching bags. This is an actual Everlast punching bag that has been beaded. Um, he did a, a large number of these, and this, it's hard to see in the photograph, but it says, know your magic, baby. Um, and he has all these slogans uh, that are related uh, to his perspective. He does large banners, um, lots of fiber work um, that is uh, um, very, much rooted in some of the traditions of uh, indigenous art making, but bringing it to this very contemporary scale. Paul Mopagi Sapuya is an artist who works in Brooklyn and his artwork uh, captures the world around him, the people uh, that he meets in bars and coffee shops, uh, his lovers, his friends. Uh, and he creates these collage images in this series on mirrors where he's using mirrors and, and sometimes printed imagery to create a, a photo montage uh, within the photograph. And then lastly, lastly, Texas Isaiah is an artist that works in LA and they're exploring again the people and the, and the community around them, the queer people that uh, surround them and how it helps them to understand their own identity and their own evolving sense of self. So these are all um, artists, you know, again, representing perspectives that we don't currently have in the Rockwell Museum, but part of our work and in, in our process is learning about who is out there, learning about how they would be a part of the conversation and the stories that we're trying to tell in the museum. I'm happy to pause here and take a couple of questions before we do cocktails or. Yep, thanks Brian, that was very enlightening. I there is one question that came into the chat um, here. It's uh, from Judy. Um, do you think being gay or bi is much more accepted in all aspects of society in this time? Uh, I grew up with a friend that was openly gay in, the, in high school in the uh, mid 60s. We all accepted him as a person and friend, so I'm sometimes confused by why people have a problem with that. 
Yeah, I don't, I think um, there's a lot of different communities. It's hard to generalize. So I think um, it depends on where you are and, and who you're with. And, you know, you can have a really accepting close group of friends, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the larger body, like your school or your town uh, is accepting or, or um, goes beyond accepting, embracing uh, who you are and what your identity is. So I think, you know, it's challenging uh, definitely to, to think about and uh, to generalize, but it's definitely a good question. I think um, that there's been a lot of progress made. And when we have things happen like we did this week, where a six to three vote of the Supreme Court gives rights um, to people who did not have them, then that is a great illustration of where, where, we've, where we've gotten to and where we're headed as a, as a society. And that's one of the things we're trying to do as an institution is to be a part of those conversations and to, um, to help people understand uh, what that means. Yeah, great question, thank you. Um, I, I do want to point out uh, Rhonda had typed in that, you know, she was thinking about in our breakups, breakout sessions, the role of empathy and the role of art in increasing it. And I know you had led and started with that conversation. So I know that was something that was thought about. So I felt like we have a lot to celebrate. It's not just pride, but we've got an amazing, um, we have amazing new rights as uh, queer people. So I'm, I'm super excited to celebrate that. Um, and of course, when you celebrate, you think champagne, but I just didn't want to like pop a bottle of champagne for you and be like, ta-da. Um, so instead, I'm making my favorite sangria. I'm going to pan down here real quick, show you my, my cocktail tray. And uh, this is a sangria we've been serving in our house for about 15 years. It, the recipe comes from Jose Andres who has uh, Yaleo and various other restaurants in DC around the world. Uh, he's a great Spanish chef and he's also a great humanitarian. Uh, he was uh, one of the people that provided culinary aid to Puerto Rico after the hurricane. Uh, he, he did everything he could to get food to the people there. So he's very much community minded and socially minded chef. And um, I think that he is a great chef, but also a really great person. Um, so I used to, experiment with a couple of different sangrias but this one's my favorite so it's the house sangria if you come to my house and we serve you sangria this is what you will get um so it is <clears throat> and we'll send you the recipe in a follow-up email so i'm not going to give you the proportions but it has liquor 43 in it which is kind of an obscure Spanish liquor. It says on the label, a secret Spanish family recipe of Mediterranean citrus fruits infused with selected botanicals. So it's an orangey uh, botanical liquor that's great um, after dinner, but that's one of the things that's in the cocktail. If you can't find liquor 43, you could also use Tuaca, which is an Italian version that's also citrus um, and, uh, and botanicals. And then a little bit of brandy um some white grape juice sugar and then um strawberries so i did this earlier it's been macerating since this afternoon because it's sangria so you want it to be all nice and and mixed up and then i've got a bottle of kava um and this is just a very uh accessible bottle of kava it's a brute so it's not very sweet if you're using something sweeter as you're sparkling then you probably just would want to cut down the sugar a little bit are you ready for the pop It's a happy sound. It's very bubbly, as it should be. And the recipe makes quite a bit. It actually uses two bottles, but I didn't need to drink two bottles of champagne tonight, so I'm only doing half a recipe. Um, it also, you can also double it really easily and do it in a punch bowl if you have a big party. It's really refreshing. It's got strawberry in it, um, the citrus. Almost there. And I think very festive for pride.
So there we go. Lovely pink color. So we're just going to serve that over ice. Add a strawberry and a little bit of mint. It was a nice, fresh summer quality. Sorry for the noise. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Happy Friday, everybody.